I think leftists, myself among them, have a problem. And it's a problem about how we, on all sides of the debate, discuss political economy in general. Much of the time we start from a single concept, capitalism. Many people then make a shallow value judgment, capitalism good or capitalism bad. Capitalism is, in many ways, the master signifier that sits at the top of political debate. To think, though, of capitalism and markets as either being good or bad is to stifle debate and to overly simplify the complexity of the world. For leftists, this is both a strategic and a practical problem. First, strategically, any attempt to criticise capitalism and to advocate for a radical alternative without qualifying what you mean by that alternative conjures up images of Stalin and gulags, and rightly so. Second, practically, many socialists and the public imagination about socialism in general is stuck in a Marxist framework, a Marxist mindset, that unconsciously guides the terms of debate. Radicals, or people who believe in an alternative to capitalism, find it difficult to break away from the totalizing purview of Marxism. And one of the consequences of this is a tendency to blame more of the world's problems on capitalism than is appropriate. But there's another major consequence of this that is particularly unhelpful. Marxism assumed that change could not occur under capitalism, that any appeal to progressivism or gradualism was ultimately misguided because the forces, modes and subjects of capital are coded, determined, to act in an increasingly capitalistic way. Like most influential thinkers, Marx was right about some things and wrong about others, but I think this assumption that humans lack the agency to create a world in the way they desire is one of the most limiting. While the phrase dictatorship of the proletariat was undoubtedly the most harmful, that first Marxist belief is almost always defended by Marxists as not being what Marx meant. See Terry Eagleton, for example. But it is a large part of what Marx meant, and it is a large part of what Marxism has come to be understood as. So again, there's the problem of both strategy and practice. The evidence suggests that the most successful periods in history and the most successful societies are the periods and places that have a good mixture of both free markets and state intervention. Although numerous studies have failed to find what kind of mix is best. This isn't the same as saying that all that's left to do is to tinker with market regulation and liberal welfare states. This isn't the end of history. It just means that we need a better way of thinking about political economy and the balance between individual freedom and communal intervention. Given the weight of historical evidence about what humans have tried, from the NHS to the welfare state in Scandinavian countries, there's absolutely no reason to believe that there aren't ways to create experimental, even radical pockets of society, where we try things like public investment banks, universal basic income, workers' cooperatives, anarchical or syndicalist or individualist communes, that radicals think that the whole system must be torn down for these things to be tried, I think is unhelpful and misguided. All of these things could be tried and experimented with carefully, methodically and rigorously. And of course, in some places, they are. We should work towards new regions of living. But my argument is as follows. Wherever you are on the political spectrum, you're likely to agree that a successful system will have some elements of free exchange individual liberty, and some elements of communally enforced norms or rules. I think even if you're a communist, you must acknowledge that it's an archaic notion that the community, the commune, the state, the syndicate, whatever you want to call it, would or could distribute all goods and services. The belief that humans could rationally distribute every human desire according to need is as much a fallacy as the belief that humans can rationally distribute desires according to the invisible hand of the market. They are both sides of the same Enlightenment coin that discount the irrational, fluctuating urges proven time and time again to be the only constant of human nature. Unpredictability is the only phenomenon that's predictable. 
see Dostoevsky, Nietzsche, anyone in charge of subprime loans, Nazis, or all of humankind. To me, this leaves us with pragmatism over ideology, but that doesn't doom us to the status quo, quite the contrary. I like to think of myself as a pragmatic critical leftist, which is simultaneously a set of partial political beliefs and a bias. I believe in the obvious leftist things like a strong welfare state, focus on education, but I'm also interested in radical ideas like anarcho-syndicalism or democratic decentralised socialism. The question is, when you bring all these things together and you're arguing with people who don't agree with you, how can you start the debate with terms that you are all likely to agree with? If you do this, then I think you have a better chance of convincing someone that doesn't initially agree with you. We might start by sketching two poles. At one end is perfect individual freedom, heterogeneity. Markets, capitalism, individual difference, no community at all. At the other is perfect homogeneity, equality of outcome, totalitarianism. Both poles are, of course, unfeasible and undesirable. One reason the second pole is undesirable is because we need a creative, free, dynamic society. This is obvious. But there are also economic reasons why, for example, Soviet-style centralised economies just don't work. The economist Frederick Hayek called this the knowledge problem, that the data required to make economic decisions is distributed across and throughout society, and so can't be efficiently understood by a central authority. Another issue, though, is the incentive problem. Too much equality, too little diversity disincentivizes innovation. In the 70s, in many Western countries, stagflation meant that too much centrally commanded activity, and arguably too little incentive, resulted in low growth, high inflation, and so goods became too expensive relative to wages. But the challenges of the first poll are just as problematic, and for us today, even more urgent. And so this is what I'll begin to try to understand in the rest of this video. How do we conceptualise what the problems and limits of markets are? And how can that help us think about political economy in different ways? I want to begin to try and think about how we might pivot our understanding of the terms of the debate. Instead of the normal socialism versus capitalism debate, we might abstract out from this a relationship between individual freedom and collective interference or guidance. We need to ask, philosophically, what is the individual and what is the collective? And there are all sorts of psychological, economic and moral answers. Part 1. Individuals and Markets Markets are, in the abstract, the individual freedom to exchange goods and services without interference from a third party. Supported then by the idea of negative rights, the right not to be interfered with. There are a number of reasons we might favour this individual freedom, but two are most convincing. The first is the moral reason, that people have a right not to be interfered with. The second is the utilitarian reason, that this leads to a better aggregate outcome for all. But we might think about non-market individual freedom too. Language, for example, is communal, forced upon us, in some ways at the totalitarian end of the pole but it's also flexible, individual, open to change. Its optimum is that perfect balance between me expressing myself individually and a community, a communal group, understanding what I mean. Music, fashion, art, culture, they all work in a similar way. The most useful way to think about the optimum balance between individuality and conformity are externalities. In his book, The Limits of the Market, economist Paul de Grau argues that externalities are an important concept in thinking about the limits of markets. The rest of what I argue here is that they're also an important way of thinking about the limits of individualism in general. In economics, externalities are the effects of an activity that are not factored into the market's price. In other words, the costs have not been internalised. 
This means the damage from the activity is not incurred by the producer or actor, or is incurred in a way that he hasn't considered or planned for. Externalities are the reason allocative efficiency is not achieved under the market, that supply and demand don't always rationally balance themselves out. The price of a product or service is meant to reflect the demand. If your product harms me in some way, or isn't as good as a competitor's, fewer people will want the product or service and the price will drop. But sometimes those effects aren't known, or it isn't known which product or which manufacturer is doing the harming. De Grau cites three examples of externalities. Global warming, for example, is a cost we all have to bear that is not traditionally internalised by industrial polluters into their costs of production. Someone might throw a can on the floor because there's no immediate penalty, even though they or we later on might pay a cost in pollution, in health, for example. Under the rational model, companies pollute if they can get away with it, if the profit from polluting is more than the cost. The costs of, say, transport are factored in. Polluting might be factored in as a cost if it affects public perception of the product, though. Companies might use a less harmful production process if it will boost sales because of public image. They'll internalise the cost. Similarly, as the 2008 crash has shown, financial markets might hide potential risk from, say, subprime loans if it means profits in the short term are higher. A banker might not internalise the potential cost of a global economic meltdown if it's not going to affect him personally. If we think this through, though, every individual desire has a collective externality. We all do things in the moment that we don't factor in or internalise that will affect us negatively later on. The duty of the collective is to counterbalance the risk of individual externalities. Not providing public goods like roads and schools also has externalities. When the cost of not collectively doing something is greater than the cost of doing it, we have a case for collectively addressing what the market cannot. Thinking in terms of externalities is not a silver bullet. We still have to think about other issues like paternalism, rights, democracy. But if we acknowledge that well-being and the general good lies somewhere between individual freedom and collective rulemaking, then the concept of externalities can help us as a philosophical tool. Where capitalism good, capitalism bad might be too simplistic, drawing the boundaries between friends and enemies before the conversation even begins, pivoting the starting point towards concepts like externalities, easy to understand and applicable to almost all areas of political economy, might help convince people of your point of view. Part 2. Psychological externalities. Humans are social creatures. The norms, language and culture we share reflect that. The more these factors are fractured and divided, the less efficient they become. The surprise is that even more well-off people are affected by this. In the spirit level, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett show how inequality has an effect on violent crime, homicide rates, obesity, mental illness and life expectancy, while after a certain level, there's no significant link between average income and these phenomena. What we're talking about in our language is the psychological externalities of unchecked individual power. Inequality breeds distrust, dissatisfaction, erodes our sense of justice, and all the common factors we need for a well-oiled, well-functioning society. This is what psychologist Keith Payne shows in The Broken Ladder. His argument is that our own subjective status, compared to others, affects our well-being as much as objective measures like a country's GDP. Pain shows how humans are biologically and socially wired to act differently in low or high inequality environments. After a certain level, it doesn't matter how well off you are, it matters how well off you are compared to others. We value and judge ourselves in relation to how well others are doing, on what we think we can achieve and deserve. Take one experiment. A computer asked participants a number of questions about their finances, their spending, their tastes and personality. After they'd answered, the participants were randomly told they either had more money than people like them or less money than people like them. 
Next, they were told that they were making some decisions about their finances. Asked whether they would rather have $100 today or $150 next week, the participants who were told they were less well off than people like them were more likely to take the money immediately, while the ones told they were more well off would wait. Next, they were asked whether they would gamble the money. Again, the ones less well off would gamble, the others were more likely to keep the money. Other experiments show how animals act in a similar way. Butterflies and even flies reproduce at a younger age in areas with more predators. The point is that the feeling of being less well off than your peers leads to short-term high-risk decision-making. People with less to lose take more risk. It's rational to do so. Crime rates go up as inequality does. High inequality states even have more searches for things like lottery tickets, payday loans, searches to do with drug tests or hangovers. We value a system that we have a stake in. If we don't have a horse in the race, we won't watch the race. If the race is rigged or the horses are too unequal to compete effectively, we won't value the game in the same way. The reason we set up the shared collective rules is so that they apply to each of us. If inequality goes so far as to either distort the rules or raise the drawbridge, block the barrier for entry, it's rational to favour other rules, a different system. Many studies show how pay inequality reduces job satisfaction, motivation and productivity at the bottom, but doesn't increase it at the top. A 2010 study shows that income makes a difference to happiness only up to around $75,000. After that, whether it's $80,000 or $80 million, it doesn't make a difference. One study looked at baseball statistics and found that while highly paid players perform better than lower paid players, the highly paid players on the teams with more pay inequality performed worse than those on the teams with less pay inequality. Inequality has a natural externality then. Too much individual power affects rich and poor alike. Status, how we value and perceive ourselves and others, is more important to us than wealth. On average, in the West, people think a CEO's salary is around 10 times that of the average worker. Ideally, they say, it should be around five times more. In the US, it's slightly higher. The average person thinks a CEO earns 30 times more. In reality, though, it's on average 350 times more. There are certain things we have to share for us to both communicate and act effectively. Language, time, a sense of culture, what's acceptable, what's not, norms and rules. If an individual doesn't have a say in these things, is unable to interact with and through them, then it's rational for them to abdicate, to seek gains elsewhere. Part 3. Moral and Political Externalities So far, we've looked at what markets and individuals are, what the collective is and why the latter is a way to correct for the externalities of the former, those externalities might be to do with health, well-being, behaviour, motivation, even war. But the vague, impossible-to-define concept we're really talking about is freedom. The whole point of the collective is to preserve or increase human freedom. In What Money Can't Buy, Harvard philosopher Michael Sandel argues that there are two ways we should think about the moral limits of the market. First, when the market corrupts and second, when the market coerces. He argues that some activities are changed or corrupted just by putting a price on them. Sometimes, he writes, market values crowd out non-market values worth caring about. Slavery is a primary example of this. We shouldn't put a price on humans. We shouldn't be able to buy and sell another's freedom in perpetuity because it crowds out, corrodes and destroys what we conceive to be a fundamental value of being human, to be free. Some things have a value independent of the price we put on them. Nature, spirituality, civic duties, their value arises out of their shared communal essence. Selling them to the highest bidder corrupts what's valuable in them while selling a TV, for instance, doesn't corrupt the value of the television. People are naturally suspicious of the scalping of tickets for a free theatre performance in the park, say. 
or of selling the rights to name a baseball stadium. Selling admission to universities corrupts something valuable about meritocracy and education. A judge taking bribes corrupts, through the market, the values of justice. Selling tickets for a congressional hearing corrupts the spirit of equal access to the political process. So when individual power corrupts an activity, we have a good basis for the community stepping in to stop that activity being marketised. The other argument Sandel appeals to is the argument from coercion. Some market activities, although they appear to be free exchanges, are predatory. Selling kidneys, for example, or payday loans might be free choices in one sense, but are also only chosen because the person has no other choices. They might be desperate. The fairness objection, Sandel writes, points to the injustice that can arise when people buy and sell things under conditions of inequality or dire economic necessity. According to this objection, market exchanges are not always as voluntary as market enthusiasts suggest. Markets encourage choice, the freedom to choose what to do, produce, trade. This is the utilitarian argument. But if a market for something clearly erodes that freedom to choose, then the reasoning for it becomes questionable. Monopolies both erode the freedom to choose and the ability for competition to create the conditions for efficiency. Sandel asks, at what point do inequalities of bargaining power coerce the disadvantaged and undermine the fairness of the deals they make? I think our aversion to big capital, corporate conglomerates and mass advertising is because we know intuitively that we are not just free rational actors. We are the product of what we are exposed to of what's the cheapest of what best satisfies our desires. Part of the reason sports grounds or parks are valuable is because they inculcate a sense of shared civic space, a talking point, a shared enjoyment, a common activity, social bonds. Selling access to them so that some people are blocked out, or even commercialising every part of them, such as the right to name a sports ground, corrupts a part of their nature. So I've tried to present some economic, psychological and moral externalities of individualism. I'm not saying that thinking like this provides all the answers, or that this sort of critical engagement with political economy doesn't already happen. Only that public debate for a long time hasn't reflected this as much as it could. I think leftists in particular have to get better at challenging these status quo assumptions and making smarter and more nuanced arguments about the limits of individual and market power in order to be convincing that starting from these basic facts, these basic fundamental philosophical points about what politics and the individual and markets are, might be a way to avoid all the negative connotations that for some people, a critique of capitalism implies. In some ways, individualists, and liberals in particular, have the upper hand because of their monopoly on what freedom, in this case the freedom of the individual from interference, means. Positive freedoms, though, like roads and education and healthcare, a basic level of sustenance, are the things that really make us more free but they require some interference by the community on individual freedom. These are just some notes on political economy. They are unfinished. They are meant, above all else, to be pragmatic rather than ideological, and they have both benefits and limitations because of that. Some questions that might be asked next time, though, are why is the collective better than the individual at correcting externalities? And why does the individual have to be coerced through, for example, taxation, rather than do so voluntarily? Is this necessarily the case? And importantly, if these are the limits on markets and individualism, what might the limits on collective action be? And why? If you like these videos and want to support Then and Now, then here's my request. If you think you get as much value from four of these videos as you do from just one cup of coffee, then please consider pledging just one dollar towards the creation of each new video on Patreon, where you can even limit your pledge to just a dollar per month. If you subscribe below, then please make sure to hit that bell to make sure you get alerted to new videos. And you can follow me on Twitter and Facebook in the links in the description below. Thanks to all my existing Patreons and see you next week.